Let me invite to the stage of a spectacular final panel of Dan Rosen, the founding partner of Rhodium Group, Huang Haizhou, who's the managing director of CICC, uh, Huang Yiping, who is an alumnus of this institution here, but is now professor and deputy dean at the National School of Development, Liang Hong, who is the chief economist, come on up as I'm introducing, um, chief economist at China, uh, at, at, at CICC, and Xu Gao, who's, who's chief economist at China Everbright. Uh, investment and asset management company. They all have spectacular bios, but I won't use our time uh, to go over them. We've talked a lot about, it's already been discussed, kind of where we stand in reform. We've passed now the fifth anniversary of the third plenum of the 18th uh, Central Committee meeting, um, which laid out as has been discussed in the prior panel, a uh, very detailed plan for, um, for reform. Um, let me start with, with uh, Liang Hong and say, wh where, where are we in terms of um, uh, reform today? Because then I want to use that as the baseline to then look forward and talk about where we think we're going to go. But if we don't have the baseline, I think it's hard to talk about where we're going. Um, I think Dan will be more an expert of... I can go to Dan if you prefer. Yeah. Well, Dan has... I was going to go to Dan next, but Dan has developed a... Um, what is benchmarking uh, based upon those... Um, the reforms laid out in that third plenum. And uh, why don't you talk about the benchmarking and um, where it stands today, and then we'll go to the other panelists to talk about where we think... Uh, what we're going to see in 2019 and going forward. Um, I would just give a very broad stroke. Okay, um, and then we can go I to think, Dan. I think there's a, uh, the widespread perception is there are very limited progress made on many of the structural reforms. Uh, in certain areas, there may be even backward uh, movements in uh, some of the area. Um, but I think probably um, a more um, uh, balanced assessment is uh, piecemeal progress has been made, uh, but relative to the very high expectation back in uh, 2013, uh, the progress was uh, disappointing. Um, and progress is in some of the key areas uh, that people are looking for, SOE reforms, uh, HUCO reform, uh, physical reform, uh, those areas are particularly uh, are worrisome. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve, and it's a delight to be um, able to be with our, uh, our Chinese friends here for this important dialogue. Right now, track twos, we refer to these as, and they play a part of supplementing the official conversation so that despite whatever the politics are at the moment, we have continuity in our relationships and our dialogue um, at a civil level. Uh, among private economists, um, people who were in government, what have you. Um, so I'm honored to be part of this, and, and thank you for including me again this year. Good to see everybody. Um, we do have a framework we've built called China Dashboard that we do with Asia Society Policy Institute. Um, we've uh, done it for more than a year. Um, it's based on analysis we did a long time ago of the 2013 Third Plenum um, program that Xi Jinping began his Euro with. Um, he really started as the best reformer China had seen um, in decades um, because he put a program on the table that, de that diagnosed China needed to get back uh, into high gear, uh, not just in a couple small areas, but across the board, really making the market decisive. That's where we talk, we, we hear that term of art that dates to Xi Jinping's gloss, his commentary on that 2013 plan. So, um, whatever we think about the, the challenges in U.S.-China today, the answer should not be that Xi Jinping didn't intend to reform. He very much did. And in fact, we look back the past six years, looking at it objectively, the way we try to gauge things, or more um, anecdotally, and it's not the case that China has not tried very hard to get reform work done. It did. Um, tried to open up its equity markets, tried to fix its interbank credit markets, tried to make renminbi internationalization and capital account uh, liberalization. 
uh, signature parts of uh, this era of Chinese um, development because China was becoming a more mature, more advanced economy and there were higher expectations. What China has discovered is that it's really hard to do all that stuff and in fact that so far nobody's invented a way to do it without a good deal of political change at the same time that you're making economic policy change and that is just not yet been resolved in Beijing that people have found a way that they're comfortable with to um, to, to uh, manage the balance between accepting political instability a little bit you know Donald Trump would love to be able to control the US Federal Reserve he does not that means there's less stability in his game plan than he'd like. But it's in the American interest in the long run that there is a separation of power between the White House and the Fed, I would suggest. Um, in terms of our, our near-term indicators here, we track 10 different areas of core Chinese policy reform, for example, fiscal, um, financial system reform. Um, eight out of the 10 are showing stagnant or negative movement toward China's own goals including on state-owned enterprise reform, where the goal in 2013 was to more quickly rationalize the use of the state's position in the economy. Uh, uh, Dr. Chen Chao, in his opening remarks today, suggested a modest agenda to get back on track a little bit more with separating those areas of the state economy where there's a good argument for why the state should stay in the lead, but then acknowledging that there's a lot of areas where the state hasn't really convinced us that it's a better answer to China's problems than the market to figure out where to, how to put money to work. I think city, uh, CICC, financial institutions play that role in a market economy. They decide what's a good bet and what's a bad bet. Um, government in China hasn't really convinced us that in normal industries, uh, tourism, real estate, things like this, general manufacturing, the state can do a sustainably good job at directing where capital should flow. So anyway, we're tracking this. We're not seeing China achieving its own objectives. Therefore, I'm actually quite optimistic that there's nowhere to go but up <laughs> on the reform agenda. <laughs> what are the two areas where there's progress? Well, there's, by China's own definition, the goal for innovation is for the high-tech industries to be a bigger share of the Chinese economy. And by that metric, China is succeeding. Now, foreigners are not comfortable with the manner in which China is promoting its high-tech industries. Some would say at the expense of uh, global high-tech firms. It's a big discussion, of course. But simply as a question of, is China more growing high-tech industries or old-line steel industry? It's definitely not growing. It's shutting, as, uh, uh, as, as uh, 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 Justin Lin just pointed out, it's done a pretty good job of shutting down old sunset steel industry mm -hmm. in order to make more room for high tech in China. It's just a question of whether that's being optimized from a global perspective or just from China's industrial policy perspective, and we should talk about that. Um, on the environment front, while China's economy is cooling and having trouble, that actually improves environmental outcomes because there's fewer factories pumping uh, smoke into the air. But aren't we seeing progress, though, on the environmental front, new technology? I mean, that's uh, yeah, on, so the on thesis those, way of responding. On those two areas, when we look by China's own definition of what is essential to keep the country out of a, a dead end, si lu yi tiao, Deng Xiaoping, and then Xi Jinping's term for it, um, we're seeing making progress in terms of the innovation share and reducing the air pollution and some of the water pollution problems. Um, but in the other more structural um, objectives, areas where actually, I think most economists would have to concede and agree, China's not accomplishing its own uh, reform agenda presently. Hi, Joe, do you agree? You have in front of you a paper which is called Perspectives on China's Market Reform. So do you, <laughs> do you agree? I, uh, I did prepare something, but uh, I, I think that I wouldn't show the chart to you. Um, I think that, uh, um, if we think about uh, how China came a long way uh, for the uh, reform, uh, I think that we need to really think about uh, uh, something really big or something really gradual. The general approach is, uh, is gradualism. However, that, uh, I think that uh, over the last 40 year period, um, um, basically that uh, China had uh, two major push for reform. Um, uh, you could call it Big Bang. One, of course, is 1978. Uh, 
uh, right after the ending of the Cultural Revolution. I think that the Cultural Revolution ruined the economy and that, that provided a very strong foundation and the need for, for, for reform. Second, of course, is uh, basically that uh, uh, after 1989, and uh, especially after Deng Xiaoping closed southern China in 1992, uh, China uh, started a, a second round of major reform. And then, of course, as uh, you will know as well, the uh, Asian financial crisis hit also hit China. So China committed firmly to basically opening this up uh, through WTO negotiation, and then, you know, everything, I think, was the second major round of reform. Uh, I think that, uh, so in a way that Dr. Uh, Yang mentioned that, uh, I think that uh, after 2013, I think if you think about it, if we, we assess the reform, uh, there are uh, indeed uh, progress, piecemeal approach, uh, somewhere here, somewhere there. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, you know, against the expectation of China to implement a major reform, uh, similar to 1978 or uh, similar to 1992 or 2000, I, uh, you know, uh, I think that certainly people will be disappointed in that regard. Uh, I think that I, I agree with uh, Dan Rosen. Uh, I would believe that uh, um, and hope uh, that uh, uh, 2019 would be a major year for Chinese reform. Uh, I want to provide two uh, reasons why I have such a strong hope for that. Number one, I think that uh, 2018 was, you know, in terms of economic performance, was really, really challenging. Okay, uh, I think that uh, China's equity market was not doing well, to say the mildly. Okay. Some call it the worst market in the market in, in the world, uh, you know, for, for, for that year. Uh, also, that if you think about the China's uh, GDP growth, uh, indeed, I agree with Justin, uh, Justin that uh, China continues to grow uh, at a reasonable, re you know, space, uh, re reasonable pace. Um, you know, maybe uh, we don't know the number yet. Maybe six point seven, whatever, in that in, uh, in, in that space. Um, however, uh, that, that's in real terms. Uh, if you measure in dollar terms. Okay, I, I, if you convert everything into nominal GDP growth in US dollar terms, uh, uh, 2018 China did not really grow much. Okay, the reason is that if you think about it nom in nominal terms, uh, China GDP probably grow at uh, somewhere around 8%. Then be depreciated against dollar somewhere around 8%. Well, you know, in the last quarter of the uh, 2018, the RMB, uh, you know, stabilized somewhat. But anyway, you know, if you measure in dollar terms, it really didn't really grow much, uh, maybe 2%, okay, M maybe somewhere in that space. U.S. economy in normal terms, uh, 2018, growing at the maybe around 6%, okay. I think President Trump would be very happy <laughs> for that. So for China, a developing country, to catch up, China will need to grow faster than the United States. China cannot, cannot continue to grow in US dollar terms, in normal terms, at 2% or 3%. Uh, uh, I think that, 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 that provides a very strong foundation of pulse for China to, to launch a, a major reform. So I'm hopeful that uh, uh, 2019 will be a year that we see major reform to be implemented uh, in China. What major reforms? Uh, hmm. I, I think that uh, there are uh, a range of, uh, you know, uh, 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 proposals, uh, uh, you know, on uh, on the table. Uh, one, of course, is that uh, we can easily go back to the uh, third plan of the 18th uh, Party Congress, right? Well, basically, that the key word, a uh, buzzword, is that the, to let market to make a determined, you know, call uh, for, uh, you know, to, for for pricing, for resource allocation. And uh, you know, I think that that says a lot. I think that you know, really want to implement in uh, in that direction. And then, of course, uh, Dr. Liang mentioned that the Hukou reform, physical reform, and uh, you know, uh, Justin in his keynote also mentioned a few other reforms. I think that, uh, yeah. And uh, I, I think that in terms of these uh, proposals, there there is no shortage of proposals. Yi Ping, do you think do you agree with that? You optimistic about reforms, and specifically, what kind of reform should we be looking for, uh, and what kind of market opening should we be looking? For? May, maybe I'll, uh, I'll offer a slightly uh, different uh, perspective. Um, I think we should uh, recognize the Chinese reform approach is a gradual reform approach, and we adopted the so-called dual track reform approach in a way that, as an economist, that I, I certainly have been observing. The Chinese reform for like more than 30 years. I can tell you at almost every point uh, in the past 30 years, I felt unsatisfied with the government policies because the nature of the gradual re reform means it, the movement is not f further and far enough, fast enough 
um, compared to economists' expectations. So that's just the nature of, of it. It's not a big bang, so you can always criticize uh, the reform. And I, my own work focuses more on the financial sector, um, and I give you one example. At the beginning of economic reform, China only had a one financial institution called the People's Bank of China. Today, you have a very gigantic financial system already, and I'm not going to give you uh, quantitative indicators. But there are two characteristics, um, and I think it stand out if you compare it to other financial systems around the world. Number one, the degree of financial repression is very high. We calculated an, a, an indicator for um, financial repression, which really measures the degree to which the government intervenes in the financial system. For 2015, out of 130 countries, China ranked number 14. Um, so the degree of financial repression is very high. Number two, um, the banking sector dominates um, in uh, the financial transaction. These two characteristics, normally you would think that they're not necessarily consistent with um, the key features of a modern financial system. But you look at what happened to the economy during the last 40 years, it certainly did not prevent the Chinese economy <coughs> from achieving 9% average growth um, during the last 40 years. And then number two, it helped to maintain financial stability, uh, basic financial stability. So my takeaway from that analysis is that, well, we all, as economists, we all criticize government intervention in the financial system. But sometimes it could work. In fact, my own empirical research find positive impact of financial repression on economic growth during the last uh, couple of decades. And then we did a lot of uh, uh, exploration. And I, the, the, to just to sum up my key finding, financial repression is bad, according to academic research, because it reduces efficiency, inhibit uh, financial development, increase financial risk, and uh, create discrimination. So it's bad. But that statement is true only under the assumption that market mechanism works perfectly. If the market mechanism doesn't work well, sometimes the government intervention actually is helpful, certainly overcoming market failure and in a number of ways. So the first point I'm, I want to say is um, sometimes you look at the Chinese system and you don't like it. But that's the way it worked in the past. And to some extent, it worked for the Chinese economy. Um, but then I would say the second point, I think we needed to move forward. That that system probably worked for the Chinese economy during the first couple of decades, but no longer. No longer in the sense that, number one, it could no longer support the kind of innovation that is required. When the government continues to intervene in pricing and allocation of financial resources, it's not a very good system. When the banking sector still dominates the whole financial transaction, it's not very good for supporting innovation. And more importantly, as you probably all know, because the government intervenes so much in the financial system, you see a lot of activities outside of the formal sector, shadow banking, fintech, and so on. These are all rising. To some extent, these are backdoor liberalization of the financial system. They're actually good for supporting the e economic activity. But they're not properly regulated. They're creating risks. So I think we need to move forward and I see the government is already making plans. In fact, they're already making some progresses. Problem, my anticipation is that more progress will be, uh, progress has been already made in three areas, and I think they will continue these efforts in the coming years. Number one, developing um, the multi-layer capital markets, which means direct financing and the capital markets should play a greater role in a financial transaction. Number two, as Hatzo mentioned earlier, um, the, 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 the rule of the market force in pricing and allocation of financial resources, I think that should, certainly should continue. And one of the indicators we could look at is interest rate, rate liberalization and probably further reform of the exchange rate. Number three, well, reforming um, the regulatory uh, framework. Liberalization would be good, but if you don't do it properly, it also increases volatility, increases uh, uh, risks, 
and could cause some financial crisis. So market-oriented reform should be supplemented with reform and building a new regulatory system in order to prevent and reduce systemic financial risk. And I anticipate that all changes, uh, progress were made in these areas. Don't you think that means a, a reversal of current policy? That is not the direction that the government is going, and it is, it is approached the shadow banking uh, sector not with a scalpel but with a sledgehammer. Not at all. Killed, not has not killed the good and the bad, not, and not therefore all. reduced kind of not provision of credit to the, the not at all. SME. Not at all. Um, I think, uh, as I said earlier, uh, development of the shadow banking and the fintech industries are kind of de facto responses by the market to government uh, control or restriction. So to some extent, they're good. But that does not necessarily mean these unregulated activities should grow as it, it did in the past. I think what the regulator is doing is that to bring them under uh, proper regulation, full coverage of the regulation. So for instance, um, the, the, uh, a lot of uh, um, shadow transactions now brought back to um, the bank, and the bank would probably set up some new subsidiaries to conduct these businesses. But they, they, will, be, they, they will be able to continue with some of the businesses, but the full, uh, full coverage of the regulation is necessary. And I think that's the same thing is happening in the fintech industry. So uh, bringing back to- uh, You're saying have banks provide funding to the small and medium-sized enterprise market? The state banks and others? The state banks are providing funding to SMEs, um, and, but that's not satisfactory uh, for a number of reasons. Um, this is a, another issue. I think the current system is not ideal in providing funding for the um, SMEs and the private enterprises, partly because of the restrictions, for instance, on interest rates. If the interest rate cannot be uh, flexible enough, then there would be no in incentive for the banks to provide um, lending to the SMEs. They are providing, but they should do more. The government is asking them to do more now, but I think we need to rethink about the policy approach that is being adopted. At the moment, the government relies on two tools um, to encourage the banks to lend more to the SMEs. Number one is administratively require the banks to do more, and number two is asking them to reduce the cost of funding. I think these are out of good will, but they may not help you to achieve the same goal. So, Ultimately, I think market-oriented reform, market-determined lending rate is a necessary condition. Xu Gao, your thoughts on this and also kind of how the credit market fits into this whole analysis. Well, actually, I, I, I want to talk about the reform uh, first, then, then the market. Well, in terms of reform, I think it is fair to see that everybody in China wants more reform. But you know that reform in China is a great experiment that you can learn little from the past history. So the crossing the river by grappling stone is always the primary strategy. But when you do that, sometimes you do touch a stone and make progress. And sometimes you don't feel stone and you step back. That's why we see stagnations in some reform measures. But I don't think that should be interpreted as that China has abandoned <coughs> reform altogether. It's just some short-term setback. And if you look at the past, past the past in the 40 years, well, in the short term, the reform past really looks like the zigzag past, with this volatility, this back and forth. But if you look at look in the long run, I think the, the past is pretty straightforward, <coughs> pointing to a more pointing to a market system. And I, that, that's, that's my view on the reform. And in the in year 2019, I think it is time to step back and uh, evaluate what we have done in the, in the last year. Well, as uh, Justin said, that uh, we focused on the deleveraging, decapitalization, and the distortion in the past two years. And uh, I think that uh, the, that has made some unintended consequences, especially on the on this deleveraging policy front. 
As you can see that the leveraging policy has has cut down the credit growth in China's economy and leading to a, a severe credit crunch in the real economy. And private enterprises are hardly, are mostly badly hit with its credit spread uh, widened to all year, all 10 year high uh, compared with SOEs. So it's fair to say that the deleveraging policies has, has done more harm than good to the Chinese economy. So I think that uh, uh, in, in year 2019, the, re the priority of the reform will be shifted to the last two items, uh, that is the reducing costs and the re eliminating uh, bottlenecks. And I think that will help the Chinese economy to stabilize in this year. And uh, I believe uh, my forecast for the GDP growth in year 2019 is 6.4 percent. I think uh, I think that is achievable, and uh, and uh, with some policy uh, adjustment, I think we will we will have a stable economic growth in China in this year. To Liang Hong, was there anything you wanted to add? Since I called on you first and meant to call on you last. <laughs> um, I just thought about um, um, everyone has their own favorite reform areas they want to see progress but if we step back a bit uh, and look at um, five six years ago what are the primary major challenges facing china uh, economically and socially from maybe xi jinping's perspective i think uh, that's actually corruption income distribution and pollution so uh, if we look back, if I try to find excuses why reform was slower than expected, um, I think China was very successful at climbing down corruption. But that may have led to uh, some unintended consequences of we start to have uh, a lack of incentive or even lack of experiences of technocrats who can execute reforms. Um, but I think if we talk about progresses, anti-poverty, uh, some of the targets they set up in the third plenary session, they actually were very much on target. Uh, pollution, the same thing. So again, um, I, I think even in the US, when, when we think about what not economists, not the market, what most of the people are concerned with, income wealth distribution, is a very overarching concern. And, and for China, again, Justin Ning and the last panel touched this, um, the consensus for so-called market-oriented reform um, become a little bit more debatable and, and needs probably take a little more time uh, for consensus for the right measures to come about. That's just a thought. One of the reasons I always look forward to this, uh, our annual forecast, is I get to put my good friend Huang Hai Zhou on the spot. And every year I ask him about the Shanghai and Shenzhen in indices. And my question this year, because the, the, the title of this is Reforms, is what's the relationship between the slow reform, or in, I think some people would, uh, you know, the, the reform that's receding rather than progressing. What's the relationship between that and the Shenzhen and Shanghai indices, and what do you see 2019 being? Oh, that's a very tough question. Yeah, I think that uh, it, it's not a linear relationship that I can tell you. <laughs> it's, it's far more complicated than that. Um, I think that the, the uh, you know if the reform uh, if reforms can be implemented successfully, uh, certainly would have boost uh, market expectations matter so much. Uh, in a way that uh, uh, if you think about the market performance, I think market performance depends on many factors. Yeah. Uh, fundamentals, uh, uh, you know, the <coughs> forward-looking uh, perspective, which is where things will be uh, going, uh, you know, not that just next year, maybe next <coughs> next few years. I, I think that all this will be related to uh, to what extent reform can be uh, successfully implemented. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, 2018 was not a good year for Chinese market. Um, uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the, the economic growth was under pressure, and the uh, growth continued to, un to be under pressure. One, secondly, as Shugao mentioned, I think that the, the liquidity was really uh, 
in particular in Q1 and uh, Q2, um, I think liquidity was uh, severely uh, uh, you know, uh, constrained by some of the uh, you know, policy measures in a way, uh, you know, shadow banking, uh, wealth management product, all that, and the, the unintended consequence become a market worry. So the liquidity situation in China uh, become very worrisome in Q1 and Q2. Um, and then, of course, the, on top of that, the uh, U.S.-China trade war uh, didn't help. Um, globally, I think that didn't help. Um, I think the last panel discussed some of that in a way that uh, it not, not only had consequences on China, uh, on the U.S. market, of course, recently, um, but also uh, it had consequences on, on global market. Uh, emerging market as a whole last year, 2018, was not really a great year. Okay, if you look at Brazil, Argentina, Turkey, and uh, South Africa, and uh, China, uh, even you look at India, I think the Indian currency uh, depreciated against dollar by about 10 percent for last year. So in, in a way that uh, in a way that uh, you know the volatility in the, in, the, in the market for last year was really really uh, you know quite high. Um, so I think that into uh, 2019, uh, I believe that uh, um, uh, you know I, I'm hoping and also I believe that China would implement more successful reforms and also China learn lesson from. I, I think from last year about the liquidity management, the, about how to clean up the shadow banking. And also I hope that, uh, uh, hopefully, that after the successful dialogue uh, led, you know, um, um, you know, by uh, Ambassador Hills and the Chairman Chin and the also, um, you know, National Committee play a wider role here. Uh, I hope that, uh, you know, the uh, US-China can reach some agreement and uh, that, would, uh, that would be really, uh, you know, helpful for the, you know, for the market, not only for China, not only for the U.S., but for the global market. Liang Hong, anything you wanted to add to your colleagues' comments, or that's good enough? Good. Dan, um, let, let me ask you, if your 10 um, benchmarks became positive, what do you think would happen to the U.S.-China economic relationship? Uh, it would be everything it should be, which is um, the biggest engine of growth on planet Earth for the next 50 years. There is an extraordinary latent comparative advantage between the world's most populous nation, China, that has a track record over 40 years of embracing economic market liberalism much more in many ways than Japan, Korea, other East Asians did when push came to shove, even though, as I would argue, and there would be a lot of agreement, there, there's a, a lot of a debate right now, as Liang Hong put it, about whether that's the right policy package for right now. But unlike a lot of other um, uh, transitional nations in East Asia, China ha actually has shown that it is comfortable with that idea set if it can deal with the, the instability and the risk involved. And there is a just gargantuan set of opportunities um, that we ought to be focusing on between China and the US. But let me point this out, that we are going through this existential strategic rethink of whether China's long-term interests and America's long-term interests, uh, economically but politically and in security terms too, are as compatible as we believed they were. And some industries that were acceptable for interaction, engagement, being maximally permissive just a few years ago, right? Um, are probably not going to be as open door you know, for a little while, at least, as they were until recently. Um, you know, Rhodium tracks Chinese direct investment outflows around the world, including in the U.S., and we have a catalog of almost 10,000 Chinese direct and venture investments in American businesses, going back. Some of which we've done with the National Committee, Steve, as you know well, going back 27 uh, or 28 years now, that included investments in aerospace, American energy, biotechnology, high technology ICT, um, and uh, you know we, we, we publish and list um, those, those activities. But if we can't find our way back to a shared point of view about how basic rules of economic interaction should work, then even the finance sector is going to see doors closing further rather than opening up. We've already seen that in direct investment FDI flows in 2018 with new US restrictions called FIRMA that are more in the direction of a kind of interventionist, I, I, would, I dare say, Chinese approach to regulating foreign participation in the economy, rather than us all converging toward uh, the more liberal tradition that America had been the beacon of um, until recently. 
Um, nothing matters more than uh, realizing this potential to see trillions of dollars, of uh, in dollar terms, of Chinese savings and investment come out into the world in portfolio investments, in direct investments by companies. To balance that, we need to see, and we, our investors, our savers, me, want to see similarly large trillions of dollars of global savings deploy into China growth opportunities. For that to happen, there need to be rules of the game in Chinese capital markets that are reasonable and are market-oriented and are not going to be arbitrarily overlaid with political considerations that are only China's and not those of Ontario teachers, CalPERS, Fidelities and cities and everybody else's whenever things get tough for China. And so those are the big questions of our era. If they're resolved in a way that is um, like-minded enough between Beijing and DC, then there will be trillions of dollars flowing in each direction, generating a lot of commercial activity and opportunity. If we can't find our way to a common set of answers to those issues, investors will go elsewhere and will of course stay home and um, fiduciaries will have to um, decline well, to uh, take those opportunities. I think that perfect segue into the next question, which is for the, our Chinese colleagues, which is, okay, we all believe that structural reform is in the interest of the Chinese people. It's in the interest of, of the majority of the Chinese people. Again, I believe the failure to structurally reform is a policy which I call incumbent protection. So it protects incumbents and the people pay a very high price for that. So the question is, what should the United States be doing? In other words, is, I think Michelle in her panel asked, is the Trump pressure positive, neutral, or actually negative? It creates a nationalist regulation. I mean, Carl, a nationalist kind of reaction. Um, you know, Carl and I were both sort of around for the WTO accession, which was basically using carrots to get China to internally reform. Hai Zhou talked about it in his uh, comments, but it was one of the times of greatest reform in China. The five years after China's WTO accession, then in 2006, seven reform began to slow um, and compliance with, their com with the commitments became much more murky. But the first five years, it's fair to say, China's compliance was terrific and reform was great. So what should we be telling the US government? Sadly, they're closed and they won't accept our advice tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, what should we be telling them? Uh, start down at that end with Xu Bao. Well, to be honest, I think uh, in some sense, the pressures from the United States is positive to China. Uh, but in some sense, it's negative. The positive side, positive side is that, um, you know, that um, to reform is to break the old equilibrium and move to a new equilibrium. And naturally, we will feel, we will feel resistance in that transition period. And uh, against that backdrop, if you have some external pressures, that can really push you forward on the, on the, front, uh, on the direction of reform. So on the, in that sense, I think it is a good thing. But the negative thing is that I think I'm afraid that the United States government or the, or the policy, foreign policy has become too narrow-minded focusing on something that is basically wrong. For example, it, is, it makes little sense to focus on bilateral uh, trade deficit or trade surplus. And uh, I, I, I don't have time to explain that, but I, I, know, I believe that most economists agree with that. Yes. And the, but you focus too much on things like that, it makes it real hard to negotiate that the role, that things that are really important. Yeah. And, uh, and you can see that the China and the United States have already integrated with each other deeply. And it is, I think it is, I think it's fair to say that it is, it is impossible for these two big countries to delink. So any attempt to delink, to delink these two countries will distort the market, will distort the global economy dramatically. And that's what we have, we will start to see in US, in, in US economy, in the world economy. And uh, uh, in that sense, I think the pressures from the United States is a, is a bad thing. Um, I think in the near term, some of these pressures are producing probably good results uh, in terms of pushing China to reduce tariffs, broaden market access, 
better protection of intellectual property rights, um, opening up certain sectors that were closed before. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm a little worried about medium term. Uh, two things. One, uh, as the previous uh, panel mentioned, a forced agenda on a very proud nation. Uh, we don't know the backlash eventually uh, how that plays out. But also, uh, I worry about some of the emphasis, some of the, for example, how the ZTE approach uh, case was handled, how Huawei case was handled, that started to push a self-reliance type of emphasis in China. So for us, we are all pro-free trade and stuff. We would like companies to specialize, but today that's not the argument that we can sell in China. EP. I very much uh, agree. Um, I think uh, um, any domestic or international uh, positive or negative incentives to encourage China to continue with reform should be welcomed, um, and they will be very useful, um, particularly in areas where um, the demands are very much in line with the government's plan uh, moving forward. So for instance, two areas I can think of easily. One is improving protection of intellectual property rights. And the number two is opening up the services set markets to uh, foreign players. These are, I think, as you can see, already generating positive uh, results. So I think any pressure, whether um, positive or negative incentive, will be very useful to move ahead. Uh, but the two things I think are points we need to keep in mind. One is what just Liang mentioned. If your pressure means a threat of isolating you, um, and uh, uh, that, I don't know, uh, the, the outcome might be unpredictable, because if the potential risk is that the US is not going to give us any access to the high-tech stuff, then you are left with developing your own technology um, without the, uh, any other choices. So I think we should be very careful. Pressure should encourage China to integrate, not to decouple um, from uh, the rest of the world. The second is about reciprocity. Um, when we say, well, we need um, China to um, reform because our regime is more open than yours, so you should open, which I agree. But if you say um, my system is, my tariff rate is zero, you should also reach zero tomorrow. Um, in principle, I don't have any problem, but I think there is a practical question about implementation. So, so for instance, people always say to me that China is not a developing country. Um, therefore, China should not be, um, be, be entitled to a, a lot of these concessions. Um, my response, to be very honest, was with uneasiness. I would argue developing country or developed country is not defined by the size of the economy, it's defined by the level of development. You look at China's GDP per capita, definitely it's a developing country. So I think that's a pretty condition. If you start by saying China is not a developing country, then it's very difficult for me to continue the discussion with you. But if you say China is a developing country, at the same time, you're the second largest economy, you have to think about the spillover effect in the rest of the world, then you should probably go for more reforms. I would actually more embracing uh, the argument. Hi, Joe. Um, I think that the uh, pressures, uh, well, reform is very hard. So I think that uh, in order to implement reform, uh, uh, I think that uh, some pressures internally and externally uh, would be needed and uh, useful. Okay. Uh, in the extent of pressure, I think is is that's where the you know the, the, the difficulty comes in. Uh, in a way that if there is a no pressure or too little pressure, I think the politicians globally probably won't do anything. Okay. I think there is a documented research by political scientists. And, and also by a uh, you know, economy specialized in political economy, uh, find this result. Um, however, I, I, I think that if pressure is too much, then basically that, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, uh, that, that probably won't be conducive either. So I think that, it, they, they, you know, the, the extent of level, uh, you know, uh, somewhat, uh, I think that not too big, not, not too small. Uh, I, I think that also that is a uh, example you mentioned that uh, 
uh, China's uh, you know, uh, accession to WTO? Well, I think that there is a very close dialogue between US and China. China got a lot of help from the United States, and that kind of pressure, I think, indeed, was, uh, was really conducive from uh, both sides, from the US and, and from China, to, uh, you know, so, so that China pushed successfully for uh, many important reforms. Uh, related to this, uh, I, I think that uh, they, uh, they, in order to uh, you know, provide um, uh, uh, you know, a, a useful, uh, you know, friendly environment, I think that uh, one side could not, uh, should not uh, take too much credit on, on the other side, in a way. So I would suggest that President Trump uh, you know, uh, would not you know, uh, send a tweet 3 a.m. claim that he got all the credit. That, that doesn't happen. <laughs> So I, I would suggest that President Trump dedicate that job to the National Committee. That would help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one lightning round question, and then I'll uh, open open the floor um, to the audience. The um, it's it's a wild assumption, but let me ask it. Let's assume the United States um, agrees to a recreation of a TPP equivalent, um, and we have an, a TPP equivalent. The United States accede to it. Would that be a positive for structural reform in China? Yes or no? Starting down there, Xu Gao. Well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it's a TPP equivalent. We know what TPP said. Well, you know, that if, it, if you use TPP as an instrument to isolate China from the rest of the world, that was definitely regarded as a threat, regarded as a bad thing from China's side. But if you, if you use TPP as a kind of a promoting the international trade, I think it's definitely a good thing and will promote, promote reform in China. So it depends on how it was portrayed to the world. Um, I think it's, it will be good. Uh, first for China, uh, we know um, China had uh, interest of joining TPP, which gives a higher standards for, for a lot of the trade and investment related issues. Second, I think it's most important uh, if U.S. does get back to a TPP, I think the multi-nationalist approach to trade and investment is what is very much needed, uh, a good news for the world today. Dan? It's what it signifies. If that happens, that means that we have learned our lesson in this country about how limited unilateral solutions to our problems are, and that we've gone back to a more multilateral approach, and that we're working on a consensus around what are the important economic policies that are, that are most essential to a strong market economy. China would be more likely to be able to build from that to better achieve its own, because these are China's goals too. The West doesn't own market economics. You know, We've uh, ex only discovered it over the past couple hundred years. China is only a, really a few decades behind us, I would say. Um, this is part of the shared uh, 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 civilization of the world, uh, not an American uh, system. But anyway, so it would help. I think, I think the TPP would definitely be helpful for structural reform in the US. <laughs> <laughs> and what about China? Uh, it mostly depends, but mostly I think it would be positive. And China would probably also accelerate the efforts in ASEP, um, and that would be useful. Hi, Joe. How about China offer TPP to the United States? <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be a positive for structural reform. <laughs> I, I mean, partly it's my, for working on this relationship for 40 years, it's my, it's my, Optimism, which can never be defeated, but I'd always believe that that um, TPP accession by the United States would create what you would have said is the fourth big bang in China, that the Chinese had already, already expressed their interest in slowly moving to a standard um, that would allow them for accession to TPP, and once that had become clear, the the, the central government would have used that as a way of forcing rapid reform but it wasn't the way the politics went. So, but it ain't over till it's over. Um, let me open the floor to, to questions, which I'm sure there, there are many of. Um, let's see, well, you've had one right here. Hi, Elizabeth Shen from UPI, I'm a reporter. My question is actually for uh, Mr. Orleans and Mr. Rosen regarding 
U.S. sentiment about China. I, I feel like this trade war has been driven by populist sentiment. Um, but those of you on the on the stage today are very pro-trade, uh, which is a healthy sentiment. So I was wondering why the split in U.S. sentiment, and can policy address this at all in Washington? Thank you. Um, look, a, a big part of this was foretold decades ago. We knew that as China and the U.S. grew closer to parity, no matter what their fundamentals were, what kind of systems we had, there was going to be more of a sense of contest and rivalry, and there was going to be more, uh, you know, more work for leaders to do to um, help the general uh, society um, maintain a positive sense. Um, of what this relationship meant and added up to. Um, making it much more complicated, uh, the leadership on the U.S. side is presently emphasizing very negative interpretations of what China means. And I, I must say that I find the emphasis uh, in policy on the Chinese side to be equally unhelpful, or maybe more so in fact, in helping to maintain a positive um, uh, sense of uh, uh, direction uh, not just for Americans, but I think people all over the world outside of China share a certain uh, anxiety that's rising. Again, a good deal of that was inevitable, and you know we have to accept that that's just what happens when power shifts in the world. But the flavor um, of uh, what China brings to the uh, international conversation is a little bit ambiguous right now and, and concerning, not just to Americans. I think the American people, as a, a majority of the American people, are not anti-trade. There is a very vocal minority that is anti-trade, that is pro-tariffs, but that the majority, if this could be put to a vote, the majority of Americans would vote um, in favor of free trade, not, not anti-free trade. Having said that, there are policies that the Chinese government um, adopts that are, you know, that the tariffs are too high, the non-market restrictions are too much of the, the, I mean, you can list 15 policies which feed those who are anti-free trade in the United States, which leads to this debate. Over here, Michael. Is that Michael? Yeah. Uh, Michael Enright, University of Hong Kong, Enright, Scott & Associates. Um, if instead of reading the third plenum communique from the 18th Party Congress in isolation, but rather if one takes the communiques from all of the plenums from the 18th Party Congress, it's much, much more about a reform of the state and reassertion of central authority, etc. My question to the panel is, uh, as we have seen a massive restructuring of the Chinese state, is that viewed as a predicate, as necessary in order to promote economic reform in a sequential process, in which case we can be optimistic, or is that viewed as a separable and parallel process, uh, independent of each other, in which case we could be uh, pessimistic, as Dan's results indicate? Do I have a volunteer? <laughs> I volunteer. <that>. <laughs> <laughs> well, it says something that but my Chinese friends prefer that to their American friends. Um, take a crack at this. And I would only say, um, I think I would only say this, that um, those who assume that, the, uh, that what reform of the state works looks like for a stronger, modern, wealthier China is uh, Beijing getting out of the way and giving power away to local governments, this sort of thing, that's absolutely wrong, right? I mean, the, the, the challenge of China's new development era is that the state does need to play a stronger role, not a weaker one in the economy. The question is, what's the nature of that role? Um, either as an economist, I very much prefer to see the state play an honest broker, pro-competitive -competi role as a regulator, making sure that everybody truly has a level playing field to work on. We have, even today in this moment, some important new suggestions from the Chinese side. We've talked about this um, uh, uh, among, uh, with our, we've gotten some in insight from our Chinese friends in recent days. Chinese interest in competitive neutrality as a possible way forward to help better manage some of the concerns in the West around Chinese SOE 
uh, role in the system in the economy. That's complicated. It takes a long time to talk that one through. But um, our, you know, there needs to be reform of the state. The question is, can the, the governance technology, the role that a strong modern center needs to bring to what might soon be the world's biggest economy, be done with business as usual as we know it in the Chinese political system? Can a one-party authoritarian system actually deliver that good government from the center? But make no mistake, China's interests and the interests of uh, Americans and other countries too require a very strong, active central government in China that plays a, a, a beneficial regulatory role. It's just we need to come to agreement about what that role consists of. Other questions? Right here in the... Good morning, my name is Stephanie Ma from Xinhua News Agency, and I have a question about uh, foreign investment in China. Uh, some market survey found that recently China has... Uh, okay, is that, is that working? Um, so some market survey has found that China uh, recently become a uh, priority for some multinational um, companies to invest in some uh, in certain industries like uh, electric vehicles and also other emerging uh, industries like healthcare and also like you you just mentioned high tech um, industries and my questions are what are the areas or industries do you expect uh, that foreign overseas companies to invest will possibly invest in, in 2019. And how would you comment on China's uh, investment environment for foreign companies? Any suggestions? Thank you so much. OK. Hi, Joe. Okay. <laughs> the evening's role is to volunteer others to answer the <laughs> OK, let me give it a try. Uh, I think that uh, as China continues to grow, and uh, uh, there is an emerging uh, you know, a middle class uh, in China. And, but uh, given the size of the population, and that middle class size, uh, you know, uh, you know, will will be will be will become the largest thing in the world. Okay, I think that uh, hopefully that will uh, you know be uh, uh, we we'll see that very soon. But the trend is very clear. So in that regard, I think that uh, China definitely is shifting more into uh, consumption, consumption based, and uh, and also for uh, you know, so healthcare, education, uh, anything related in that area. I, I think that. Uh, uh, would be uh, you know in high in high and increasing demand going forward. Our research department did a lot of research on this, led by Dr. Liang. I, I think that's a, certainly is one of the important areas. The second area, of of course, is related to technology innovation. I think that uh, the electric car is is certainly in that area. And uh, and uh, but I, I think that the China as China continues to grow, uh, China will need to invest a, a lot more uh, in in technology. And uh, so I think that China has been doing a lot in that area. So I think that China welcome uh, international uh, companies to, uh, you know, uh, invest in China or, or move the headquarters to China, and the CRCC can help. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to need to, Ya Yang. I think we're going to need to just invite you. Do you want to make some closing remarks because we're running out of time? Well, I was going to have you make, uh, well, the, the, they'll remain here and you'll just stand up here. So there's no need to have the panel go back to their seats. But uh, the panel has been great. And I thank you all so much. OK, uh, so time passed uh, really fast. Uh, so we have uh, finished today's uh, forum. And I hope uh, that. Uh, uh, you learn uh, something from here. You can we should see uh, even among us uh, Chinese economists, uh, we have really diverse opinions uh, about uh, the Chinese economy. Uh, but uh, even with that, I hope uh, that we have clarified some of the doubts in your mind. Uh, we also want to take uh, this opportunity to thank uh, the City Group again to provide. Uh, it's a wonderful venue uh, for us, uh, and of course uh, to thank uh, the National Com uh, Committee uh, for uh, their support uh, for our dialogue and this uh, forum. Uh, I hope uh, when we come back uh, next year, we are going to have better news uh, to tell the audience. <laughs> See you next year. And let me just let me just add to. Uh, 
to Yao Yang and ask one thing of the audience, Yao Yang's comments and ask one thing of the audience. I mean, needless to say, the U.S.-China relationship is in its most difficult period in probably 40 years. Um, there is difficult news that comes out every day. And there's a lot that can, for somebody who's worked on that relationship for 40 years, there's a lot that can get you down. But one of the things that lifts my spirits is when we have dialogues like this, that we can get together with our friends from CCR and, and talk frankly about the issues. And it's so important that kind of we can talk, and even when we disagree, we, we talk in friendship and we talk frankly and, and, uh, and truthfully to each other. And I sit there and I just hope our governments can do it too. That it's really important that our governments do, and it's important that the debate in China and in the United States be based upon facts. So Abbott, MasterCard, Xcold, Chubb, Van Eck, and Citi have provided this in the belief that what we do is important and sheds light when there's a lot of heat. So what I ask of the audience for having provided you this, what I think is an incredibly informative three plus hours, is that when the debate occurs, and when you, you've got a lot of experts in this audience, and when you know it's wrong, when you know, whether it's the Chinese government or the US government, is spewing stuff that's just not true. Don't sit there and say to your friends, it's just not true. Speak out. One of the reasons the debate has become as bad as it is, is that people who know, people who can benefit from this, don't speak out. So what I ask of you in exchange for what we've given you this morning is just speak out. Just do it. But thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.